Welcome to the How Did They Do It Real Estate Podcast. Have you ever wondered how people succeed in real estate and what steps they took to get there? If so, this podcast is for you. Your hosts, Sayla and Eileen Prack, interview top experts in the real estate community to share with you their real estate journey and how they achieved massive success. Our goal is to provide you with valuable real estate resources and to help you apply it to your own real estate goal. Welcome to today's episode of the How Did They Do It Real Estate podcast. I'm your host, Eileen Prack. And today our guest is Pete Reese. And he's actually from a royal bloodline. He's actually the great grandson of King Henry II. So that's super interesting that to share this as well. Um, but he's also the president of Real Vest Properties, a land development and investment company. And with nearly two decades of real estate experience as a broker and investor, he successfully purchased and sold hundreds of pieces of real estate for profit over the years for himself and on behalf of his clients. And he's currently on track to earn four million dollars in revenue in 2022 with his land flipping and development business. And he's also a father of three beautiful daughters. So Pete, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Great. Um, I'm doing great, Eileen, and uh, great to be here. So Pete, can you share a little bit more about your background and how you got started with real estate? Well, it's been quite a long journey. Uh, not all a smooth road, but uh, but a fun road, I could say. So it started, um, I guess, our first real estate. And when I say our, that would be myself and my wife, Heather. Our first kind of investment in real estate was our own you know, home that we bought in, I believe it was 2000. And uh, that we bought it at the right time. And that home we ended up I think only keeping a couple years, we lived in it for about a year and then rented it out for another year. And then we heard that you could take the profits tax free. So we we just ended up selling it. And uh, that kind of got the bug, I guess, going. I guess it, it got us really interested in kind of the real estate world because we made for at the time we made, I don't know, something like $50,000. And that was like, like life changing because we were a newly married couple. And, you know, that that was like amazing to have that kind of lump sum. Then I started seeing these shows on TV with people flipping homes. And uh, I thought, hey, we could do that too. You know, I did some of the improvements on our first house. And looking back, they were probably very low quality because I did them myself. But <laughs> but I did learn how to get into some of those things. And I knew enough that I should be hiring some of that stuff out. So about 2003, we started actually actively buying and flipping homes. And um, our first investment was kind of one of the, uh, you know, aside from our single family home that we bought was uh, a property where we just, uh, we purchased it. We didn't do anything to it. And then we resold it right away. And actually at the time, it was crazy because that's when they were doing a hundred percent financing loans. So it was like an 80, 20 kind of loan. And so we didn't put any money down, uh, maybe had to pay a little bit in closing costs. Uh, and then we resold it within, I don't know, 60 days, something like that. And we were like, this is amazing. This is too good to be true. <laughs> so, and we didn't even do anything with it because as soon as we bought it, someone contacted us and wanted to buy the house from us. So, uh, it was just one of those those freak kind of situations, but it kind of really got us going and into the real estate investing world. They're not all that easy for sure, but it was very interesting to start with. So uh, it, it was so short, in fact, that our loan broker was like, hey, what's going on? <laughs> the, the loan company called me and uh, they they don't want to pay me my commission because you did. Oh, that, that's another thing I should mention. We actually didn't even have to pay our first payment. So it was it was so quick that it just oh wow uh, the time the way the timing worked out so one of those deals but it did kind of launch us into doing more and more um, flips and everything the real estate uh, investment uh, the whole real estate market in Southern California um, really took a dive in 2007 through 2009 and at that point we kind of got scared off from the market and didn't do much investing ourselves. In the meantime there, I did get my broker's license, I think in 2006 in California here. So I started deal, working with some clients. I've done everything from working with uh, luxury homes to uh, investors. Um, and then during the real estate crash, I got into working with banks uh, as an REO listing broker. So selling properties for the banks. And then I got into doing short sales as well. Uh, long story short, 
ended up uh, eventually getting back to doing real estate investing ourselves. Uh, a couple of years ago, really got into uh, land flip- flipping, land investing, and it's just kind of taken off from there. So, oh, wow. Land flipping and land investing. Are you focused in that in the California market or outside of California? I've actually only uh, sold a couple in California, but mostly other parts of the country. A lot of our properties end up are, are on the East Coast. So those, those are sort of the areas that we've been focusing on lately. And probably about 95, 97% of the properties I've never seen. Not in person, at least. <laughs> <laughs> and pictures. <laughs> yes, pictures. Yes. Because <laughs> land, one land, one piece of land versus another piece of land. I mean, there, there's not too much to see <laughs> in terms yes. of like what's there. <laughs> yes, exactly. It, it's it's really interesting. You learn how to. I mean, I, I don't know that this business really would the way I do it now would have really been possible even ten years ago. Uh, we have so many good apps and um, resources at our fingertips that we're able to find out so much about a property, you know, with just from our computer screen. So we're, we're able to find out most of what we need to know. And then we've developed great partners on the ground um, that can go out and actually do the physical inspection on the property, get out there, check it out. Um, we work, we always work with uh, brokers um, to resell the properties for us. So they always give us their opinion, you know, what they think they could resell the property for as well. But how long typically do you hold the piece of land and um, what is the typical, yeah, what is a typical hold time for, for the land that you're purchasing? Uh, about 60 days. 60 days. Right. Yeah, I know. Most people, and, and I was in this camp too, I thought that, I always thought that land was one of those things that, yes, there's good profit potential. Yes, you can make money on it, but you have to be prepared to hold it for a long time. And That can still be the case if you're doing the business in a certain way. But really the way that we do it is that we we buy off market. So we buy at a price that's uh, really pretty aggressive. And those are the only properties that we buy. So we, we buy at a price that's pretty aggressive and at a price where we can still market it at an aggressive price so we can generate a, a sale really quickly. What do you look for in land um, in terms of criteria, location, um, and and who's the end buyer or who is the end buyer custom or who is the end buyer that you're looking for? Right, that's that's uh, evolved a little bit over time. We really typically look for quality properties, and by quality properties, I mean we're trying to avoid some of the, the major things. There's there's a lot of properties out there that are what I would consider kind of junk properties, you know, that may not be a kind term, but but really they have a major problem with them. You know, like it's could be it's landlocked. Um, it could be that it's just a big swamp. It could be that it's um, it's some really odd shape that no one would want. You know, so most of the properties we buy at this point really are at least 10 acres. So they're more of the rural nature, you know, and as I've gone along here, I've kind of tried to focus on bigger and bigger and bigger properties because that's where the, the more profit potential is. But, you know, we just try to avoid a lot of the major stuff and and positive things like if, if a property has road frontage, if it's, you know, relatively uh, flat or at least rolling topography, if it's not wetlands. Uh, if there's some nice timber or trees on the property, that always helps. So we try to avoid the 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 real big downfalls, and then we also look for some of the other things which which could make it appealing for an end buyer. And the end buyers typically are, you know, maybe someone looking to build a home site, could be someone looking for just kind of a recreational property, or it could be another sort of uh, larger landowner in the area that that looks to accumulate properties. And there are a lot of them out there as well. So walk us through this process. Like, let's say you get a property, a a piece of land that comes through your inbox. What do you do to start to validate or start the the evaluation process of whether or not you're going to go ahead and purchase this price or purchase this property? And then like in terms of how far does it have to be from the city? um, What are some other metrics that you look at? You also mentioned you buy an aggressive price. If you can share maybe that price point that you look for as well. 
Sure. Uh, well, our, our rule of thumb, uh, kind of going backwards on your questions, the last one first, like our kind of rule of thumb is we're always trying to double our money. So if we buy a property for 50,000, we'd love to be able to sell it for 100,000. Now, in reality, that doesn't always work out. You know, sometimes we'll buy it for 50 and sell it for 80,000 at, at the end of the day, which is still pretty good, <laughs> especially if 60 you're only days. Wanting 60 <laughs> days. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, we've had ones where we've only made $1,000 on them, but uh, I haven't, knock on wood, haven't lost uh, money on a property yet. So, but, um, so getting back to, to some of the other, your other questions, you know, like what the process looks like, um, we generate all of our business with direct mail. So we send out just a ton of letters and these are specific letters to, you know, property owners. So, uh, um, and then we also narrow it down like, Hey, we're mailing in certain areas or, uh, certain acreage ranges within those areas. And then we're just kind of seeing what comes back. People will either call in, they'll email us. Um, they'll also send us mail back sometimes. And, uh, at this point I've got a team built. So I've got, a have got a, a team member that enters in everything into our CR, CRM system. And he's got a checklist of things that he prepares so we can evaluate the properties pretty quickly. Uh, we use, a we use an app called MapRite, and that gives us a ton of information about the properties themselves. We're actually able to look at all the satellite images. We're able to see the contours. We're able to see if there's wetlands. We're able to see if it's in the FEMA flood zone, road frontage, all this kind of stuff. So there's a checklist of a number of those different things that we go through initially. And then we're, we're talking to the... I've got a, uh, another team member that's our, our acquisition manager, and her job is just to to get on the phone or by email or text and kind of communicate with the seller and kind of, uh, you know, go down another list of questions about the property just to kind of dig in and try to figure out as much as we can about the property without actually being there. <laughs> um, and then we could tell generally uh, right away if it's, if it's a decent property, we're also looking at comps and, you know, we're not a member of all these different MLS services around the country. So for the most part, we're using Zillow and you can look at land comps on Zillow like you can, you know, home comps. So we're checking comps and then we're looking at all those different comps and trying to find the best ones, getting an idea how fast they sold on the market and uh, if they were priced too high, if they were priced right initially and how long they took to sell. Uh, we also look at metrics for a particular area. You know, is there more the demand than supply uh is it pretty balanced or is there more supply on the market than 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 demand and in those cases we would know we would have to be priced uh super aggressive in order to get a quicker sale what so. typically goes into those mailers when you send them out yeah we we send actual offers like we put a price on there and uh so they're customized to each property that you're sending it to exactly yeah so we're using averages for certain areas. And these are things that we look at ahead of time. We might say this certain county, you know, kind of sells for an average of like, we can retail it for maybe 5,000 an acre on average. And then we back off a certain percentage of that. And then we put that in our, uh, our offer price. And then it's just a big mail merge and it gets sent out and mailed to thousands and thousands of people every month. So some people don't like receiving those type of offers in the mail. Unfortunately, you know, we're, we're not looking, I realize it's not going to be a solution for everyone, but some people that uh, are interested in looking for a quick cash sale, you know, that's, those are the people that uh, we're able to deal with. So. Got it. What percentage do you think is your conversion rate? Uh, based off of the mailers we send, it's, it's very, very low, like very low. Like we send out, uh, you know, probably this year I've, I've sent out about an average of 50,000 letters oh. a month. Wow. A month, 50,000 a month, a month, a month. Yeah. Yeah. But I'll tell you, I'm, I'm very picky at this point. You know, at first I used to send out a lot less letters and I would, you know, go forward with properties that maybe were a little bit more marginal. So at this point I'm kind of looking just for the cream of the crop and, um, we probably don't go as forward. You know, if I wanted to be more aggressive, I could definitely go forward with some of the, some more properties. There's a lot more people interested. We get a lot of responses on things, but it's, it kind of has to check all the boxes for me at this point, because I know, I know wh where the stumbling blocks are. I, I, 
you know, at this point I, I know like what properties, what mistakes I don't want to make again, I guess. <laughs> so what would be one of the biggest mistakes that you made that, uh, you know, you wouldn't want to repeat? Uh, well, one of the first properties I bought was, and now this wasn't, this wasn't a loss by any means, but it was just kind of a pain. So what, what, it, what the property was, it was a, uh, it was, I think it was something like a 14 acre property and, uh, it came back and they were interested in selling it. And it had, um, I think the offer price we gave them was, I don't know, something like $20,000, which is, you know, on the surface sounds good. Then I looked at it on the map. It was completely uh, landlocked property, which is at this point, I don't buy landlocked anymore, but <laughs> uh, but anyhow, this is a landlocked property. So we went back to them and, and, and it had some wetlands in it and it just it was in a major city. So it didn't really, it was kind of weird. It was kind of like a, long narrow weird shape and i was kind of like hey you know there's not really anything i could do with this property if you want to sell for three thousand dollars we'll we'll just we'll buy for that and i I was thinking it was like a price so low they would just say uh nah, nah, you know like we're not interested but they came back and they said okay we'll do it and then I thought, okay well i guess i'm <laughs> buying this landlocked you know three thousand dollar property so i thought wow well, i can easily you know sell it for $15,000 on the market. And I tried and no one was interested. Well, I got lots of interest, but you know, and everyone's like, well, what am I going to do with it? You know, that type of thing. Anyhow, long story short, probably four or five months later, I did end up selling it. I think I ended up selling it for 5,500 or something like that. So I still made a profit. It was a pain in the butt. I didn't make much of anything on it. Um, and then, and then that's kind of where I came up with one of my rules is I'm not buying landlocked properties anymore. So I know that there's a lot of investors that actually buy those, those properties and do very well with them. It's just for me and for, for what I'm looking to do, it just doesn't work out. In comparison to, uh, like the comparables when you're doing the comparisons against it, what is a typical like price point or average that you're looking for to be able to purchase the property for? And then what's the average return or uh, sell price that you're looking to sell it to another buyer? Mm -hmm. Well, at this point, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to focus on properties that are actually uh, 50,000 or more. Uh, I used to, I used to go down to, you know, th that 3000 was the cheapest property I ever bought. Uh, most expensive was uh, 300,000. Um, but uh, kind of kind of the range that I that I want to be in is at least fifty thousand, all the way up to uh, we've got one we're buying right now is four hundred fifty thousand. So it's just kind of it's kind of a big range. You have to do all cash. There's no financing with land, so it's a matter of you know like do you want to commit four hundred fifty thousand dollars to buy a piece of land, even though you you think you could double that? I mean that's kind of a uh, you know, that's kind of kind of a big gamble all at once. But so, you know, we try to double our investment every time. It doesn't always work out that way. Um, I'd say on average, we're, we're probably in the, um, you know, gross margin of 40 to 45 percent somewhere in there. So. Got it. Yeah. In terms of like demographics do you look at a percent like like how much of the population lives in that area what are some of the other metrics in that area do you evaluate to make sure or to make sure that this would match what you're looking to do with that land property mm -hmm. uh, most of the time we're we're looking at kind of the number of sales versus the number of listings kind of like one of the major metrics I look at is like in this area, in this kind of range of acreages, like say, if say I take a County and it's Johnson County, something like that. I, I take a look at like all the properties that are 10 to hundred acres and how many have sold in the past 12 months there. And then I look at, well, how many are on the market? So if there's a hundred that have sold in that range in the, in the past 12 months, and there's 50 on the market, that's, that's pretty good. You know, there's, that's like about six months of inventory, I guess you could say on average. Uh, if there's 200 listings and only a hundred have sold, that's pretty bad. That's like two years worth of listings. So in, in those cases, so that's kind of the major thing. I mean, I like kind of, um, 
looking at a major metro area and taking like the areas kind of like a big circle around it, you know, like a radius of an hour to two out of that. But it doesn't really restrict me, really. You know, if I'm in a state that I like working in, as long as I see kind of things, properties moving there, I'm I'm fine to to go for it. Because one thing I I have learned that as long as you can price a property right, a uh, piece of land and it's a decent piece of land, it will sell. So, how do you typically price or value the land? Well, I really rely heavily on broker partners that we establish. So each area, you know, kind of like all of our major areas, like one of the first things I do is try to find someone that's like a land specialist broker and I call them up, have a conversation. And being that, I, that I'm a real estate broker myself, I know kind of, I can, I know kind of what's involved. I know kind of what to look for, like if someone's going to do a good job for us or not. So I just go through some of those basic questions with them and see if there's a good rapport. And then I kind of like explain to them, hey, we'll send you, you know, as many listings as we can. But one thing I need help with is your, you know, your opinion on what you think you could resell the property for. And I explain to them, hey, we're not looking to get top dollar, even though that would be nice. But our main thing is we want to sell a property quickly. So I realize we're going to have to discount it a little bit to do that. So, you know, what do you think it would take to to sell it in 30 to 60 days? So. So are you finding the sellers through your broker relations or are there other ways that you're finding the sellers as well um, and lining them up as you have these land under contract? Oh, um, as far as finding the sellers themselves, it all comes from public uh, tax records. Oh, I'm so, sorry, buyers. Oh, the buyers. Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, yeah, we <laughs> we get pretty much everything <laughs> listed on the MLS, and the only time, and then we use the the local brokers to do that. Um, so you know, I don't I, even though I'm a broker here in California, I don't take any. You know, I'm not looking for any sort of. Uh, we we pay full commissions to them, top commissions probably. Well, you know, um, so. I'd rather them like r- really be interested and motivated to sell the property. So, and, and sometimes, you know, if they're really good, they've got buyers in their pocket already, like looking for this type of property in that sort of area. And they're kind of uh, talking to their potential buyers as we're working through the process to buy a property. So that happens sometimes. So that's really the only time it doesn't get less than on the MLS is if we find a buyer ahead of time. Got it. So also you mentioned that when you're purchasing land, it has to be an all cash. So there's no financing on these land properties. Mm -hmm. If you're buying 50 to $450,000 worth of land, how are you getting all the cash? Is it through investors? Is it through yourself? Or, um, Or are you getting like private money lending as well? How does that kind of work on the financing side? Like if somebody doesn't have like the 50 to $450,000 right. <laughs> yeah, to put yeah, all cash down. It's, well, it's tough. And I didn't start, you know, doing the bigger deals like that. I've, I've kind of parlayed it higher and higher over the past couple of years. Um, but uh, at this point, we do uh, everything self-funding ourselves. Uh, we've been able to build up a pretty good, you know, slush fund for that type of stuff. Um, but there, in this business, there are people that will partner with you. You know, if you decide, or if you don't don't have the the capital to, to put towards these deals, there are people in, you know, kind of this land investing niche where they'll they'll actually partner with you. They'll put up the money, and then they split the profits with you. So, if you've got a good deal there are people that would be happily partner with you. So if somebody wanted to get started, where would be the best place that they would start looking for potential land investment opportunities? Well, you kind of have to generate those opportunities. I mean, the first thing I would start with is education. You know, uh, it's, it's a matter of like figuring out how the business model works and then kind of trying to focus in on how how you're you're thinking you're going to do it. I mean, because there's a lot of different niches. There's people that will just buy up, you know, desert squares as they call them, you know, like one to five acre parcels in the middle of the desert that they can buy for 500. And then they sell to people on payments and, you know, they get a great return on that, but it's, it's really hard to, and, and then you're, you're, you know, basically, uh, a servicer, a bank loan servicer. So that it's a whole different business really than, than what I'm doing. So it's a matter of like getting the education and figuring out 
like your particular model within the land investing side of things. You could also get into doing th- stuff like development. That's very lucrative. You could do minor and major subdivisions. You know, minor subdivision being, in most cases, you're looking at taking, say, um, you know, a 10 acre parcel and then you're splitting it into five, two acre parcels and then selling them off individually. That's very lucrative. And a major subdivision would be something like a mapping out like a whole major subdivision and then selling it off to a developer. So that's kind of a home run type thing right there if you, if you get into that. But, you know, it's a home run, but those take a lot longer to sell. You have to put a lot, a lot of money into the uh, engineering and that side of things. And uh, you're not going to have any cash flow in the meantime if you're doing those type of projects. What are some of the markets or if there are any markets that you would avoid or you particularly don't care to invest in? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm definitely not one to do the desert squares because I, I don't, I just don't see long term like what what the point is. Maybe there are people that want to like live out in the middle of the desert or something like that. Um, but it's not high enough dollar really to to be interesting for me. It would be it would be tough to make the kind of money I want to make if I'm selling two thousand dollar parcels. It, it would just take a lot, a lot of overhead. And I'm not saying it can't be done. It's just it's just not the business model I want to do. So I, you know, personally, I think it's a matter of finding states with a lot of activity, a lot of land transactions, you know, where there's active markets, people looking to buy land either for recreation or for housing, or maybe the area in general is kind of growing and uh, kind of focusing your um, your efforts in places like that. You have to decide too, are you going to be uh, self-funding your stuff or are you going to be, you know, using maybe a partner to help you fund it? Because that's a consideration as well, because you know, it, it may not it may not be a good idea to kind of send out, you know, mail in San Diego County or something like that uh, when the price per acre is like so incredibly high. It might be better to send it off to somewhere in the southeast or uh, maybe Midwest or somewhere where the where the price per acre is lower. So, you know, so you don't have to spend so much out of pocket in order to get a deal and, you know, start get the get the process going. Got it. So when you're purchasing these land properties through the direct mailing, it's like a one, they're off market. So they're one to one. So you're not competing with other people. How about on the sell side, when you go to list the properties, how is the market on that side of things in terms of demand on the people who are actually looking to buy land? Um, How does that environment look like? It's actually really pretty good. You know, obviously everyone is concerned about the real estate market right now and the direction it's going. We haven't noticed that we haven't noticed much of a drop off. I'm not saying that that's not going to happen because I I do think that it probably will drop off a little bit. But in the areas that we've been working in, it's the demand is actually pretty good still. And I, you know, the, the interesting thing about this business is the fact that, you know, since our hold times are about 60 days, it allows us to adapt like really pretty quickly. And we're buying at prices that are really pretty aggressive. So I feel in most cases, if we, you know, if the market started really dropping or whatever, we could, we could get out of a lot of these properties pretty quickly, you know, at least for what we paid for them uh, on the downside. So it's, um, you know, it's one of those things that we're going to be adjusting, you know, If the market goes down, we're going to be adjusting our our buy prices down. But there's there's been pretty good demand. And as long as you're priced aggressively and it's a good property, uh, right now there are buyers out there. And what's next for you, Pete? What's next? Just trying to build our business. And like I'm trying to get to the I'm trying to get to four million in revenue this year. I think I'm on track. So and then as part of that, what what doesn't show up into those figures is the uh, constantly trying to build our portfolio value of the of the real estate we own. So there's the revenue, and then there's also the value of the real estate that that we have that's either in escrow or you know being marketed right now as well. And some of those things, I, I do have a couple properties that are kind of a longer term old properties. So they could be uh, one of them in particular is a property that we're marketing as a subdivision. And I know that the marketing on that's taking a little longer, but once we do sell it, it'll be a bigger payday. Um, the other thing that I think is a really big opportunity that I'm 
learning about and trying to get my education up on is the renewable energy and how that ties into maybe uh, developing a solar farm or multiple solar farms or something something like that. So I think that's the future. And uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity in those areas. Oh, yes. I remember driving out to like Las Vegas area. And if you look in that direction, there is like this huge solar farm that was just built. And I never really paid attention until recently. I'm like, what is that? And then I realized it's a solar farm. It's huge. You know, it's like... um, it's interesting because the more I dig into it, the more interested I am about it because you can get financing for it. Um, it basically turns your piece of land into an income property, which is kind of like, you know, your your tenants are your solar panels. And yes, you have to maintain them and wash them and, you know, keep them happy, I guess. But, you know, there's no, not going to be any, you know, tenant complaints or anything along those lines. So, And Pete, how has real estate investing impacted your life? Well, it's been great. Um, I was just thinking the other day and talking to my wife, Heather, I haven't had what I consider like a, a job, like going to work for someone else since 1999. And and a lot of that's uh, because of the fact that I was able to get involved in real estate investing and kind of the real estate market in general. So it's given me ultimate flexibility. And it's also been great for my kids. I'm teaching them everything I know about the land investing business. And they actually, uh, I've been sending them some of the smaller deals that we've got and they've actually done really well. And uh, they've parlayed, uh, they started with 8,000 and now they've parlayed that up into uh, 60, about $65,000. Wow. Right so, yeah. Yeah. And they're, you know, 20 and 22. So, you know, I wish I would have had that when I was their age. So. Oh my gosh. Imagine the runway on that. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's exciting. And I think they've sold... See, there's three or four properties at this point. I think four properties, but oh, it's yeah. hands-on experience. Yes, so I'm <laughs> trying to to get them to do as much as possible, but helping them along the way as, as much as I can. And if there was one thing that you know now about real estate that you wish you knew when you first started, what would that be? <sighs> well, I wish I knew about land investing way before <laughs> I figured it out. That's that's really the the main thing. I mean, it's a whole. It's a whole nother niche that I was just completely unaware of. So I wish I knew about that. And what sets the successful people apart in real estate investing? In real estate investing, really, it's about getting a model, like taking a business model that's proven that either, you know, it's not, you don't even have to come up with your, yourself. You just need to emulate maybe someone else that's successful that's doing a particular model and something that kind of aligns with, you know, what you think your strengths are. And then just going all in on that and kind of duplicating that over and over and over again and not getting sidetracked. So just getting better and better and better at that, trying to uh, grow your revenue, do more deals, track it, track everything and just just keep it going. So you get into trouble when you start, you know, freelancing and getting into all these different things and trying and investing in this one asset class and another asset class. And then you get pulled in too many different directions. It's tough to be successful that way. And Pete, where can I listeners find out more about you and what you're doing? Yeah, I've I've actually got um, doing monthly income reports on our business. So trying to... um, Detail, be as transparent as possible, detailed uh, deals that we do every month, revenue that we do every month, gross profit that we do on, on each of those deals, and uh, got them written up in, in monthly income reports. So you can follow my progress there. It's turning, it's a, you can find it at turningprofit.com. So that's awesome. where you can find me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Pete. Well, thanks, I mean, I appreciate everything. And thank you for listening to our podcast today, brought to you by Bonavest Capital. We would really appreciate it if you can go to iTunes right now and leave a rating and written review. Also, please don't forget to subscribe so you can always get the latest episodes. You can also connect with us on Facebook, How Did They Do It Real Estate? We'd love to hear your feedback and any topics that you're interested in for future episodes. Lastly, to learn more about us, you can go to bonavestcapital.com and fill out the contact us page so you can speak to us directly. Nothing on the show should be considered as specific personal advice. Please consult your legal, tax, and real estate professionals for individualized advice.